Good evening, everyone. <coughs> Happy New Year. This is the first digital healthcare event of 2014. I believe this is our sixth digital healthcare event. Am I right? Am I right? Um, so we're just delighted that you could be here with us. Uh, my name is Vijay Gurbatsani. I'm the director for the Center for Digital Transformation. Um, and we're just, we, this is our second anniversary almost. It, on March 1st, we'll be celebrating our second anniversary. And we actually launched a little bit before our public launch. So this is really our second anniversary. And we're just so delighted that all of you could be here with us. Uh, and we're delighted with how well this program has grown. You know, I, I, for those of you who were here a few weeks ago for our social listening event, it was a really kind of interesting event to hear about how companies actually monitor conversations uh, on the internet and in social media. Um, it, it, it is just kind of heartwarming to all of us. What I said then was we launched this, we said, a wing and a prayer, not quite sure kind of whether there would be any traction. We're just so delighted that every event we put on just draws more and more of you and many repeat customers, which tells us that uh, we're touching the right notes. And, and, and I'm very grateful to all of you for your continued uh, support. The Center for Digital Transformation is uh, a part of the business school, the Verizon School of Business at UC Irvine. Uh, and I'm delighted to report to you today that we got our highest ranking ever. We are now a top 25 business school in the US by uh, uh, financial <laughs> Hold your applause, hold your applause. And e-business is the one area among majors and specializations within business schools that we just got ranked number 10 in the world. So uh, we are It really speaks to kind of, I think, a lot of the activities that my fellow faculty at the business school are doing, and actually across the campus. Uh, research centers certainly help. Uh, and what we're trying to do is really build focus around things uh, that we see as transformative. And certainly, we believe that digital is extremely transformative. The fact that all of you are here kind of indicates the same thing. You know, I was speaking at a meeting of the entire IT team of a very big pharmaceutical company in LA this morning. It was fascinating to hear the challenges that kind of the pharma industry is going through as a result of digital. So the notion of consumer engagement, what that really means, that the pharmaceutical companies actually don't touch their customer very the patient very much. Or the notion that social listening that I referred to um, is actually also monitored by the FDA. So if you go on a website and say, this drug caused a rash, the FDA picks up on that. So the world is really changing, the power, balance of power is changing. So what we're here to talk about today is really trust, the speed of trust, which is really about kind of healthcare information and how much kind of faith we can have in a lot of the, around security, privacy, all the issues around that. And there's a lot, been a lot of research on that too, because I'll just give you kind of a consumer story. You know, the reason we have seller ratings on eBay when eBay first launched is because nobody would buy from an anonymous seller. And we have sort of the same kind of issues in healthcare as well. How do we have legitimacy, value, trust? In the data that's being shared, the information that's being shared, and worry about kind of, um, you know, if your credit card number is stolen from Target, it's a lot less hurtful than if something very private about your health actually enters the public sphere. So there's a lot of issues that I am certainly not expert about, but we are fortunate to have a wonderful team of experts who will be talking about this issue. I want to turn the floor over to Sam King, who is our industry fellow uh, at the Center for Digital Transformation. Sam is also an alum of the Mirai School and has been absolutely fabulous in putting together uh, these events. He's the thought leader in the space who kind of builds our speaker agenda and, and, and plans these events. And Sam, thank you so much for everything that you do for Center and helping us be as successful as we are. Thank you so much. Thank you for your kind words. Uh, well, welcome everybody. I see a lot of uh, old faces. I see new faces. So, like Vijay was saying, that's good news. We have a return customers and new customers. Both are good, right? So, I, I will be very brief, um, and I want to uh, single out uh, our moderator today, David Feng. Uh, David, would you stand up just for seconds? Uh, last year, last September, to be exact, David and I were at the uh, High Regions Hotel, right? behind the Capitol Hill. Now, remember, September, what happened? Edwards, Snowden, leakage of NSA. So we're just joking about what happened, why this trust issue when you as a consumer can spend $5 
and get everything you need. Trust me, in five seconds, if you punch your credit card number, you can get anybody's private information, medical or otherwise. But as a patient, as a consumer, we don't want to have a communication. We don't want to have medical records that tranquilize. What's going on? So we start up this conversation about trust, about security, about privacy. Well, moments later, David and I say, well, why don't we do a forum centered around patient engagements, privacy, and security? <coughs> so here we are this time, right? And David and I further contact many, many uh, wonderful speakers who will be introduced later on. So I'm very pleased to see this forum is materialized, and thanks David and everybody's efforts. So, just want to say again, thank you, welcome, and you're going to enjoy tonight's events. Thank you. <laughs> With that in mind, I'm going to introduce you Dave Novesky, who is the Exec Director of Healthcare at NetApp. Uh, Dave is not a stranger to many of you who have been here in previous events, so I'm not going to do a lengthy introduction. However, Dave, that's all yours. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Sam. So, um, yeah, David's obviously an important guy because he gets a guy introducing the guy who's introducing him, <laughs> which is great. So, uh, for the folks that don't know NetApp, um, NetApp is a leading provider of data storage and storage management solutions. We happen to be the largest provider of storage products to the federal government, so the Veterans Administration, the intelligence community, so we have a, a, a long, deep background in uh, providing secure access, encrypted disk, working with other uh, companies that, that provide uh, security products, so that's kind of why we're here today. We, uh, we really enjoy the opportunity to, to uh, just be involved with, with such a terrific group. And um, before, I, before I introduce David, um, you know, a couple, couple of interesting facts which makes this conversation extremely meaningful. Last year, there were 267 million records that were breached uh, in the U.S. And of those, 43% of them were healthcare records. Okay, so that's a, that's a pretty startling number. But um, cheer up, it gets worse. The, um, the other interesting poll statistic was 45% of patients lie to their doctors. Doctors. They, for a variety of reasons, but one of the primary reasons they do is they are concerned with what they say and who's going to get their hands on it, what's going to happen with it. And so as we start to look forward into the great need for patient communication, for interoperability, for integration in order to make an effective ACO, and most importantly, as I, as I saw one of the upcoming topics, analytics, what do analytics really depend on? Analytics depend on quality of data. Data governance is the, is the foundation of, of really quality analytics. Well, if 45% of your patients are lying, what's the quality of the information going in? So patient privacy and security isn't just an issue about protecting the records of the patient and possible HIPAA violations and fines and, and all those sorts of punitive things but it really has a very meaningful effect on uh, our ability to, to, to do quality analytics in terms of the delivery of care and population health. So think of it in a much broader context. Uh, and now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce David, who reminded me that there's a very fine line between an introduction and an obituary. So he said, <laughs> he said to be brief and be off. Um, David Finn, for those of you who don't know, is the Health Information Technology Officer for Symantec. Uh, prior to Symantec, he was the Chief Information Officer at uh, Texas Children's Hospital. So he's got more than 30 years experience in healthcare, in, in planning, and management, and control of technology and business processes. So um, I would have to say he's, he's legit. He's legit. So without further ado, I'm going to, I'm going to turn it over to uh, David, who's going to introduce the panel. Thank you. It, it didn't sound like an obituary, so I'm very grateful. And so is my family. Uh, uh, Sam was right, this event started as a conversation, but now I'm going to correct the uh, story. Uh, we, we were having a conversation, we were talking about 
the loss of data and, and the Snowden issue. And uh, I was talking to him about the fact that today information flows at internet speeds, but in healthcare, information flows at the speed of trust. And I think Sam kind of liked that phrase, and uh, I did too, so I said, you know, I'd really like to do a panel on that and get the various perspectives, a consumer perspective and, and a physician perspective and, and, and someone who actually has to live with this stuff every day. And Sam said, well, I can make that happen if you'll get the panel together. And, and so I uh, get to do a lot of panels, but I'm really jazzed about this one. I had a great story about uh, trust and a personal experience I had, but for the sake of time, because the smart people are still sitting down uh, and I'm standing up, uh, I'm not going to tell you that story. Uh, I am going to tell you that I believe trust in healthcare is critical. Uh, and trust has to include keeping private information private, but privacy is really a much broader issue. Uh, it's just that our personal health information is so, well, it's personal. And, and that's where it gets tricky. So I did want to share with you, uh, these are some of the cameras I encountered on my way from the hotel to the campus uh, tonight. And, and I'm just kidding about that, but I think everyone is aware of the fact that we're monitored a lot. We're on camera, we're tracked online, uh, we're tracked in our cars, more on that to come. Uh, and as technology advances and gets smaller and more accurate and, and wearable, it seems some people have been finding ways to intentionally invade our privacy. And I try not to get too paranoid, although working at the world's largest security company, it's uh, easy to get too paranoid sometimes. Uh, but I want to share some thoughts from one of the advisors to the National Critical Infrastructure. This is a, a, a gentleman by the name of Stephen Hunt. And he says, in practice, Americans are notoriously willing to give up their privacy in many instances. And this is a quote I really wanted to share. Privacy is not something we protect, exactly. It is something that seems to have no value at all when we are the ones sharing personal information. We proudly post the genealogies of our children on Facebook. However, we bristle at the thought of someone knowing something about us that we haven't knowingly shared. I don't think Big Brother is the government, or more precisely the NSA. Big Brother is us. We are the ones installing cameras and scanning equipment to protect our private uh, sector homes, businesses, and neighborhoods. We are the ones making our lives visible and digitally recorded. So uh, everyone's heard of the Consumer Electronics Show, right? How many of you in Ford had a booth this year? Yeah, kind of cool. Except most new car, car buyers don't realize when they sign their documents, they're actually signing an agreement that allows the uh, auto manufacturer to track data on the car location and the amount of time that someone has spent driving it and where they are. And there's actually been legislation proposed called the Driver Privacy Act. Has anyone heard about the Pri Driver Privacy Act? Pending legislation on uh, keeping your car quiet about your uh, comings and goings. <laughs> and the Triple A, uh, not a leading privacy advocate, but the Triple A has now weighed on this weighed in on this, uh, with the uh, three guidelines. They say, this is okay as long as you provide transparency of what data is collected and how it is used. Two, give consumers the ability to choose with whom they share data and why. And three, make sure the data is secure. That sounds vaguely like healthcare and it's the auto industry. I think you get a picture of where we're headed. Uh, now, in case you think I've forgotten that we're talking about healthcare information, I have included a couple slides here on some of the changes coming to healthcare in terms of sharing healthcare information and patient engagement. And while these things all represent improvements and benefits to the process and quality of care, every time we share information, it also represents a risk to that data how it's collected, who uses it, for what purposes. 
So uh, this is just some statistics on where we're headed, and I'm not going to read you the slide, but patients uh, are demanding, and the federal government is now saying you have to give patients access to their medical record. Uh, what's interesting is some of the uh, things they want to do, the additional functionality coming with patient portal 2.0. Uh, and this uh, next study, and I apologize for using Accenture rather than Deloitte, Harry. Uh, <laughs> what, what was interesting to me is A, the number of uh, patients who have claimed they have full access or think they have full access. Uh, is a number only slightly smaller than the number of patients who have no access to their EMR. And when you look at that top statistic, 40% of U.S. consumers would switch physicians in order to get access to their EMR. I think we have a new driver in healthcare, and it's not the hospitals or the physicians affiliated with those hospitals anymore. I think we're going to see the patients driving a lot of this. Now, before I turn things over to our panelists, though, I have one last slide. And uh, the point of this slide is I kind of come at this from a security perspective, not necessarily a privacy perspective. But as a former auditor and a former privacy officer and a former security officer, I just wanted to share this with you. Because uh, you can have great security and no privacy. But you can't have privacy at all without some kind of security. And these are kind of the overlapping areas from my perspective. I'm sure you're going to hear more about this from all our panelists. Uh, and the way the thing is going to work tonight is uh, each of the panelists is going to get a chance to introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about where they fall on these issues and what's important to them. And then I'm going to ask some questions, and you don't get to. And when I'm done asking questions, then we're going to open the floor up with the microphone. We're going to let you, you get the most time, but because I'm the moderator, I get to start. So at this point, I'm going to turn things over to uh, Dr. Harry Greenspun, who I've known for many years. He is my favorite geek doctor. <laughs> I'm not sure that's a compliment. Oh, it is. That's meant with deep affection. Well, it's good to be here, um, and I was just flown from D.C. early this morning, sorry about that. Drawing out on the airplane. Um, it's fascinating with the opening comments um, about uh, patients lying to doctors. I'm a doctor. Um, simple country doctor, I should know. I'm a cardiac <laughs> anesthesiologist, um, and uh, I did my training at Hopkins, and I got involved in health IT when we were doing minimally invasive heart surgery. And we were tracking those patients with paper forms like you tracked everything else. And so around the time the internet was coming around, and I thought, well, oh, it's kind of interesting. Maybe we can compare things that way. And I got interested in how do you use technology to, to transform care? And a big part of that was how do you move information around? How do you make it available? Because now we have the ability to, to in real time, benchmark what one center is doing against another, what one doctor is doing against another. And how can you move that data around? And how can you make sure that you have the adequate safeguards on it? to make sure you're making sense out of it. Um, but the fascinating issue, and who, who was the guy who did the introduction? I lost it. Maybe back there. Um, but patients lying to doctors. And they do all the time, right? Um, but what's interesting, they also, patients also tell you things, incredible things. And I'm a doctor, and when I'm on an airplane, and someone knows I'm a doctor, goes, well, you're a doctor. And whatever comes after that, I don't want to hear. <laughs> and it happens a lot. And they do that because they think because I'm a physician, they can trust me. And because I'm not their physician, they can ask me some totally weird thing that they won't ask their doctor. Because I will go tell your doctor about that. Um, and so we have this fascinating thing about people's view of health care. I want to talk a little bit about consumers. So I'm, I'm at the uh, the Center for Health Solutions. We do research on the interview. We, we survey consumers, we survey physicians, we survey a lot of folks, and we write about all this stuff. Um, and I sit on the World Economic Forum's uh, Global Agenda Council on digital health, and how do we promote sort of the movement of this information globally to improve access, cost, and quality, how do we do better research, all those good things. And what's interesting is when we survey consumers globally about health care, we find a couple fascinating things. First thing is you find that 
unless you come from a country that's famous for beer or chocolate, you're pretty unhappy with the healthcare system. Um, you can work out what those countries are. Um, and if you ask people about their healthcare system, um, they have very, very strong opinions about how it works and whether it's good or whether it's bad. And you find out what it's based on. It's really based on the last time they ever got care. It's not based on the system. It's based on their own personal experience in the system. What's fascinating, too, is that when you ask them how our system works, they go, I don't know. Um, and you go to Canada, for example, where they have similar systems. You ask people, how does your system work? They go, I don't know, hey. Um, and, <laughs> um, and so when we ask people about if you make a change to our system to be more like someone else's system, the Canadian system or the UK system, whatever, the average consumer has no concept of what that means. They don't understand how their system works. They don't understand how other people's systems work. And so when we think about systems which move information around and they're able to track all sorts of stuff, it's very hard for consumers to understand that. Partially because consumers also don't necessarily think the way the healthcare systems think they think. Um, who's got a good doctor? How do you know? She makes me feel, she answers all my questions, I can trust her. She, has um, she researches things for me, I have questions on. She answers your questions, yes. spends time with you. She texts me back right. very quickly. Now you seem, she's responsive. Yep. Right. Now you seem healthy. Yes, I hope so. Are you healthy because of your doctor, or are you healthy in spite of your doctor? Um, because. <laughs> okay, all right. Now you believe that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but interesting, when you ask people about how good is their doctor, very few people, when I say very few, I mean none, say, <laughs> Um, that um, I know that for my age and for my family history, I've all prevented um, care that I was supposed to have. Or I had a certain procedure and the outcome I achieved was better than, it, you know, than you know, the benchmark that was expected. No one says that kind of stuff. Right? It's really about the service experience, about what it's like to get care, as opposed to the quality of care. And all of us know people who stuck with a doctor despite terrible outcomes. Um, and stuck with that person because they thought, oh, that person's a good doctor. And so when David shows some of this information about people interested in switching doctors about, um, uh, over access to EHR, they're not actually switching for data. What they're switching for is service experience. Like all of us know that if you order from Amazon, um, you can track your package, right, by FedEx or whoever, and you get a text message the moment it gets delivered. You go to your doctor, and your doctor says, hey, we're going to draw some blood, and we'll get the result back in a week or two, and we'll call you if it's abnormal. Like, I know this technology exists when I order dog food. Right? I should be able, when I get my labs done, be able to get that same kind of information. So the, it's the service experience that people are trying to get, which they understand other parts of their lives, and then they start moving data around. And data's funky. So who's afraid of um, uh, having their identity stolen and getting their bank account? Who's afraid of someone getting a colonoscopy in their name? <laughs> <laughs> it's a different kind of identity that we're worried about. Because we're worried about the loss of individual bits of information in a medical record. It's a whole thing. It's a little thing. It's that they're actually out in Vegas, right? Something that they don't want to share with other people. How did you ask someone on an airplane about? Uh, and so uh, these are the kinds of data that, that people are, are worried about. So we have one issue of, as a consumer, what are you going to trust people with? Then the other thing is, when you ask someone, do you trust their answers? So when we survey consumers, we find that, of course, everyone loves their doctor, right? Everyone loves hospitals. Everyone loves medical societies, right? To be a little bit lower. Um, people actually like the government. Like FDA, NIH, they like them. Right. Um, then you start getting down to sort of the WebMD kind of world, or sort of disease-specific stuff, you get a little bit shaky at that point. And then we have a Google. Right. So how many of you have Googled something for health? That's everybody. How many of you gone to your doctor and say, based upon my Google results, I have every cell leukemia, and I want to be on this Who will do that? What they do is they take this information that they get online and they take it to a more trusted source. They right? say, so is this applicable to you? 
So this sort of it's kind of this myth, uh, this myth of people going with this big stack of printouts from the internet to their doctor. Um, it just doesn't happen that way. Right? People actually learn stuff and then find, well, does this actually apply to me? Is it applicable? Um, so then we get to the bottom of the trust barrel. So who lives down here? Who do you think? Congress. Congress. Yeah, some lawyers. No. Um, uh, so who lives in the in who are the bottom feeders of this wrong word of trust? Who do you hate? Your insurance company. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, all the insurance people here. Um, <laughs> right? So your insurance company. Who else don't you trust with your health? Who's who's trying to make you work harder? Your employer. Your employer, right? Do they care about your health? No. They want you to work harder, right? I didn't mean that. Um, so <laughs> you get your insurance company, your employer. Who else has like a vested interest in you being sick? Drug companies, pharma, 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 pharma right? Right? They don't have There we go. Oh, no, 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 it's an insurance company giving you all sorts of tips, and it's all the assets of the pharmaceutical companies that are sort of bombarding us with that help. And we don't trust this information. So we've got, we got a big problem here of we have consumers who have information they don't understand about quality being given information by people they don't trust about their health, which is actually quite complicated. So it starts to get you know, one thing on top of another. The, the last thing we'll wrap up before I, before I get out of here, um, is, well, not that far, okay, sorry, um, is <clears throat> this concept of health information. Um, so, um, who of you are like doing online dating right now? Thank you, Sharon. Um, so, <laughs> you know, were I online dating, we're talking about. Um, um, I would say that I like long walks on the beach and go to the opera. Right? That sounds good. Uh, right? <laughs> However, if you look through my credit card statements, you'll see that in the last 30 years, I had never purchased an opportunity. <laughs> Ever. Right? So it sounded good. Right? But if I wanted to find out like, who are the opera lovers, I wouldn't ask them. I would start looking through their visa bills. So when you look at the kind of information we get about people from data that's not healthcare data, so lifestyle-based analytics, you can find out tremendous amount of stuff. So going back to your Ford example, right? So I may tell my insurance company I am an awesome safe driver, right? But in fact, if every day I'm running into people and paying off the cash, <laughs> so who's got progressive auto insurance? I'm not progressive. Anyone progressive? Do you have that chip in your car? Okay. So what progressive will do is say, hey, you want to save some money? We'll put a chip in your car. Say, monitor your driving. Sounds great, right? Um, so um, what it does, it says you how hard you brake, how hard you accelerate, what time of day you drive, right? Because if you drive at 2 o'clock in the morning on Friday and Saturday, maybe you're bad dress, right? Um, big invasion of privacy, yes? No. Yes, no, yes, no? Where I'm driving? Maybe? You a little upset about that? No, you're complicit. You're saving 20 bucks a month? I'll do it. Right? We see it all the time, right? Most of you have the, the cards from your supermarket. You also get unwittingly do all this stuff. And as you took that data, we have a much more complete view of who you are, much better than your health care stuff. So if I if you have high cholesterol, I can put you on a statin, I can look all that kind of stuff in your medical record. But if you're eating Wendy's four days a week, right, that's kind of telling. So we'll get into these guys when we get there, but just remember that. You get this world of you know of trust issues, misunderstanding data, and then an entire world of information about what goes on in your life that impacts your health is actually not contained in healthcare records and is not covered under a lot of the types of things that we use to do that. So I will pause there and we'll go on to our next. Our, our next panelist is Leslie Kelly. And uh, and uh, Dr. Grace Bond can be. Uh, Seen performing in Las Vegas. <laughs> Healthcare review next month. So, thank you. Hi. Well, I work for.
Harvard HealthWise, which is a company that started 38 years ago, is not for profit. The idea that uh, patients were the most untapped resource in healthcare. And we are this teeny little company out of Boise, Idaho, that's had our content used one billion times. And we are under WebMD and under Kaiser and under the top 10 health plans and the group health under most, Geisinger, under most of the health systems uh, that are big main health systems today. Uh, used by consumers all over the world in many different languages. And actually written in a very, very, very trustworthy way with high degree of medical review, 200 physicians uh, and about 240 staff members. So why uh, I'm involved is um, as a non-for-profit and very interested in consumers and consumer engagement. As a former CIO, and VP of Marketing of the health system, yes, the geek with a message. Uh, <laughs> I knew firsthand how technology could help to transform customer relationships. But it is all about trust. Um, and the trust is about a lot of things, but I'm gonna talk about three today. Transparency, common ground, and relationship. Healthcare has moved at healthcare speed for a long time. When consumers enter the picture, we'll be moving at iPhone speed. We are ill-prepared. Ill-prepared to manage, to interact with, and engage with patients in a whole new way that they will demand. A group of patients came together, and consumer advocates in, in DC, and we asked this group of people, what do you want from a digital ecosystem of health? I said, I want to be a contributing care team member. I want to know how I can pair with others in my condition and share information with them and how to improve with each other. I want to make sure that there's nothing done with me, without me, or about me, um, without me. I want to make sure that every time you work on these EHR systems, there's something over there for me. When you design an electronic health record, there should be a corresponding design for a patient. Largely, we think of those as two separate buckets not thinking any name of health. Also said that every time we design patient-facing systems, it shouldn't be encumbered by the epics of the world. It shouldn't be encumbered by old uh, database design. We should actually use and embrace new technologies. So in transparency, we think about nothing about me without me, or CC me, some or all of my records, or open your notes. So uh, many institutions are working on the Open Note project. Uh, Beth Israel Deacon, Deacon has started this. There's really been profound results in how patients are more interactive, more compliant, or <coughs> adherent. When we think about the accountable patient, which makes my skin crawl, frankly, um, we think about the shoulds. Patients should do this. We should do that. We should be held accountable. I'm told to change my oil every 3,000 miles. I should do that. <laughs> I do it when there's a jiffy boob in my mind, on the street, at the time I happen to look at my mileage, and I have a credit card available, and I have time. Otherwise, I don't do it. I have consequences as a result of that, truly, but those are my consequences. So instead of me being an accountable patient where I should do things, how about if we were an accountable team, that we co-produce health together, we co-produce my health together. Part of that is having transparency, having access to information. So getting access to information, HIPAA ensures the right that you have access to your health information. When you go to a provider and the provider says, I can't get that to you, it's a HIPAA rule. How many of it have that happen? It's crazy, it happens all the time. When in fact we have that right. Did you know that you have the right to amend or correct your health record? With that means digitally. We had that review by the Office of Civil Rights this last year, along with privacy and security. And that right has been extended now to every single citizen. We have the right to request that our record be amended or corrected. That principle and that right has now been passed to us in a digital way. And we'll be using regulatory levels as we go forward. I did mention I'm, I'm also on the Meaningful Use uh, Subcommittee and the Health Information Technology Standards Committee and the Privacy and Security Committee and the, under the Office of National Coordinator. So yes, I'm partly to blame and I would like to hear your feedback 
Um, he believes specifically around patient engagement, if any of you are involved in that. So transparency is a big deal. Largely, we have been successful in meaningful use. Does everyone know what I'm talking about? Who knows what meaningful use is? Okay, so about half of you. So meaningful use is a government program that was to do with health information technology what the freeway systems did in the 50s. Let's connect things, let's get the plumbing installed, let's get the records in place and automated so that we can start to digitally share information. Since the, this inception, we now have over 4,000 hospitals, 300,000 providers, and $15 billion is, has been spent in incentives. This is, cannot be denied. Uh, it has been quite successful getting the plumbing in. It's been difficult. It's not been easy. But it had, has given us now opportunities for interoperability and connectivity that we've never had before. So meaningful use required first in phase one that electronic access to health information for all patients. That hospitals provided patients with discharge instructions or patient instructions that clinical visit summaries were passed between institutions, and that each patient was entitled to educational resources specific to them, to their condition, their age, their gender, their height, their weight, their chief, di chief complaint, principal diagnosis, discharge diagnosis, and such. Stage two of meaningful use, which has just now started, has required that every patient have the ability to view, download, or transmit to a third party their record on request. This is a big deal. How many industries have completely transformed when the movement of the data gets shifted from one party to a different party? Big deal. So now as we move into this next phase, patients will start to say, hey doctor, I don't want you to send that record to that doctor. I don't have to give you a reason. I can just say send it there and they're required to do that under law. That will change the balance of power. We'll begin to see that now. We'll see it expand in the future with the next phases of need to use. We also have the ability to do secure messaging across providers. In our next phase of meaningful use, patient-generated health data will be included, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So the government is serious about moving this agenda to allow patients the ability have transparency with their own electronic health record. How many of you heard of the blue button? Good deal. So the blue button uh, was started when Anish Chopra, I believe, and Todd Park and others said, could there just be a blue button as a patient where I can push that and download that information? Well, we now have over a million and a half people across the country that have already downloaded their health record. This is a White House initiative. There's a group of us uh, that met at the White House to start talking about how we could promote this initiative. And it's been adopted by both providers and insurers to download the record in a standard format that can be used and then moved from place to place. So the blue button allows you to have information pushed or pulled. That's a big, big difference in data, not just to view and download it or to send it to you, but I can pull it to you, pull it to myself as things change. So, you are the keeper of the healthcare information. You know your systolic and your diastolic blood pressure. You know your medications, your cholesterol levels, and your blood pressure readings, even your blood glucose readings. You are the one person who can remember and share every single detail when you need it with your doctors, family members, pharmacists, home health providers. What if you were unable to recall your medical information and the best treatment was delayed, waiting on that vital data only you had in your head? Now, with Blue Button, you can have reliable online access to your personal health information anytime you need it. Your health information may be available for you to access online, and you have every right to access it, check it, use it, and share it when you need to. Visit healthit.gov slash blue button and take control of your health. With Blue Button, the power of your health information is in your hands. This is a public service announcement that will be released uh, next month and is the one of many to talk to patients about getting access to the medical record through the Blue Button. It's a huge deal. 
and they're already starting to report um, institutions who have committed to this and are already letting people download their information. So that was the ability to view, download, or transmit. But I also have the ability to pull data as I need it. So apps can connect to the EHR in this next phase of the blue button. So the provider initiates a patient portal. The patient then activates the portal. The patient registers their apps. And the app is updated by the EHR real time. So this is set and forget it. Once I register my app, any change that's done to my medical record can automatically come to the choices I have. Now that might be my own chart that I keep in Excel. That might be my app on my favorite provider's website. Because the average Medicare patient has working physicians, perhaps I want to pick a provider and say, that's where I want my home record to be. That's where I want my home record to be. Whether it's a patient, I start directing where the source of truth is, and it's to my favorite institution. We start talking about changing market dynamics. Product dynamics. Relationships are important to trust. I'm a contributing care team member. I am a credible source of information. The messages that we share are material to my care. I am the stakeholder with the most at stake. So let's turn that blue button upside down. But in order to upload information, that's very different than downloading information. When I download information, that's done at my risk as an individual. I get to do with what I choose of that data. When I upload information to a provider, for them to accept that data, that has to be so secure because the risk now is just not to an individual, but the entire paper patient population in that data structure. So uploading is a whole new game. So do I know who you are? Level of assurance or identity management is a big deal. A level of assurance one is, I am who I choose. Anybody remember Magic Kingdom cards or anything like that? <laughs> All of you have gray hair or dye your hair? <laughs> <laughs> I am endorsed by a relationship and an ID, my Costco card. I come in with my ID, they endorse me as a, a person now belonging to their club and they issue a new identity to me. Or I am endorsed by a government entity. That might be my passport or my driver's license. These level of assurance or level of identity will determine the policies of use of data. So for instance, if I have a high degree of endorsement of who I am, as a provider, I might send something to you, and as a provider, you say, yeah, I'll take it. I know Leslie, she's another doc. We have a digital relationship and we have digital trust certificates that we can pass. Now I'm Leslie as a patient and I'm going to send you information. My email is gmail, you know, back it up at gmail.com. Will you take it? Probably not. Probably not. So as we shift to uploading information, this question of digital identity and assurance and security will become much more profound. How many are sick of passwords? Who's ready to passwords? How many of you could go to the passport office, show your ID, be given a digital certificate, and only use that forever, and never have to do a user or password ID? Would you do it? Yeah. I would. Right? Microsoft was uh, too early to that game. It came out with something like that called a passport years ago. It was too early to the game. But now we have password and user ID in the team. And guess what? It can be cracked within an hour and a half. So we are very, this is very long coming. We need to start addressing this now. Uh, Direct Trust is a non-for-profit that's been established to really look at the policies, procedures, digital certificates, and uh, trust bundles across the health IT ecosystem. I'm on the board of directors and chair the patient engagement group. Trying to advance the use of a secure email infrastructure for not just the provider to provider, but the patient to provider, or the patient to anyone on their care team. And the care team could be my aunt, could be my daughter, could be my doctor, my acupuncturist. The care team is who I define. And so as we begin to put this digital trust network in place, we have to solve these problems around things like level of assurance and identity. What's done, though, it's pretty cool, right? I can have this right in my outlook. 
It shows my, uh, I've got a trusted bundle. It's easy and familiar. It's certificate protected and able to interact with any other accredited agency. Where the policies are still forming, um, but meaningful use will promote secure messaging for patients in the age of this three. It will also promote the use of patient-generated health data. We just put that forward in our final recommendations Monday. So it is a, it is a very big deal and worth doing. Someone said, Dale, we need to slow down, we need to slow down. It's only three years so we need to do these three, we need to slow down. Hell, we built all the battleships for World War II in less than three years. We can do secure email. <laughs> this is just not rocket science, it's just work. So we also have to find common ground. Why do patients lie to doctors? Because before we can have a trusted relationship, we have to believe that the other party has our back. That we have mutual interests, we have mutual benefits, that I can trust that person to do what's right for me, and I will do what's right for them. We largely do not have that. We don't have the common ground. Why is it important? Well, patients, it's just really important for a patient to identify their health goals. Their health goals may be very different from their care goals. I don't necessarily want to manage my A1C, but I want to make sure that the wound in my foot is better so that I can walk down the aisle with my daughter. So establishing goals with patients, making sure that you're participating in shared decision-making. And shared decision-making is not a consent form that says, do this, you understand risk. It says, I understand all my options available to me. I understand the cost, the risks, and the benefits of each option. And together, we make that decision. Do you know what health means to me as a patient? You should be asking that. We should be asking that. We should be offering that information. Because health and the co-production is health is not just an episodic relationship. It's a relationship over the life of the patient in terms of patient actually determines. So with common ground, we have common goals, collective understanding, and shared decision making. This is a woman named Peggy Jo. I would encourage you to go to YouTube and look up Peggy Jo. This is a channel that we developed. This woman found me. She discovered I was in policy. And she came to me because she said, Leslie, I'm dying. Every fall, my brain bleeds. Every, and I become more and more impaired. I've been to every healthcare system imaginable, and no one can diagnose this, and I don't have a cure. She knows so much about the way her body works now that she goes in the emergency room and she says it's bleeding right there. She is an amazing and articulate woman. She invited me into her home and opened up her guest room, and in it was ceiling, floor to ceiling boxes of medical records. And she said, Leslie, somewhere in here is my diagnosis. And somewhere in here is my cure. Isn't it a shame that we can't find it? So she's changed, changed my life and um, helped to inform people in policy. I'm the only one who knows what it's like to have the brain bleed inside my body. I know how I feel on chemotherapy. I know what it was like to be in the coma. I know what it's like to have the hemangiomas. So I have really valuable information that nobody else has. And there's no place in our medical records that that voice is actually documented. And that's really frustrating to me, you know, because I want to be a part of the group. I want to be inside the circle. I want to be talking about it. I want to figure it out. You know, I want to live. It's pretty simple. It gets down to that. We are the people with the most at stake in healthcare. I've heard patients referred to as targets. I've heard patients referred to as that diabetic in room. 302. And yet each of us, as patients, feel that we have a lot of stake every time we go to have care. So we hope that the, the opportunity for the digital trust is to be a new equalizer in healthcare that presents the patient in a whole new way as a digital equal and a participant in a whole, whole health. We think that the patient is the biggest transforming agent in healthcare. And our uh, final panelist presentation for the question is uh, Mary Allen. Mary is literally bringing it home tonight because she is from right here at UCI.
I get to close out the panel discussion with the patient's perspective on their health care. I'm a nurse. I've been a nurse for over 30 years. I have, uh, most of my experience has been in quality and uh, case management. So I've lived a lot at the patient level. I now am seeing quality through the patient's eyes in patient experience. I'm part of the UC Irvine uh, team, part of UC Irvine Health. Uh, we are the clinical, medical education, and research component of this big, huge, beautiful campus. We happen to have medical center down at, uh, in Orange, where all the uh, three freeways collide, and so do the accidents. <laughs> so we get, uh, we're a level one uh, tertiary quaternary trauma center. Uh, we also have behavioral health uh, and uh, acute rehabilitation, unfortunately, for a lot of the trauma patients that we do see. Over half a million, uh, excuse me, over half a million patients are seen at our campus, either here at the uh, Irvine site or at the Orange campus every year. Our emergency department um, sees a large amount of our patients, uh, thanks to the, the freeway collisions, but 60% um, of our patients that are hospitalized have walked through the doors of our emergency department, or they've been transferred in from someplace else in uh, California, Inland Empire, uh, Northern California. These patients weren't really planning on coming to the hospital for a stay. They were just going to the emergency department to identify what little thing might have been going on, or perhaps they were on their way to a dinner party and end up colliding. So uh, they are filled with a lot of emotion when they show up on our doorsteps. <coughs> Technology doesn't always address emotion, so we have the opportunity to show our compassion and caring and align technology with their needs. So I'm going to tell you a patient's story and how we earned his trust. Uh, recently, we had a 52-year-old gentleman who was transferred from the Central Valley down to UC Irvine. He would started his day relatively simply. He was making a cup of coffee, and he fell suddenly. Didn't understand why he fell, uh, but he crashed to the ground and fractured his pelvis and his hip in multiple places. The hospital uh, that he was at in the Central Valley could not handle this complex um, surgery, so they reached out to Southern California. We accepted the patient six days after he had been admitted to the hospital. He was in tremendous pain. When he arrived, uh, his mental status was not good, but uh, so we did a CT scan to find out what was going on. Had he hit his head during this uh, time? His family was also saying that he had a history of left-sided weakness. He didn't arrive with any medical records. We could not go online and find his blue button. Uh, however, we did have a brief uh, history that we could go to. That CT scan identified a brain tumor. So the reason he fell was because he had this massive tumor that was uh, putting pressure from the right to the left side of the brain. We earned this gentleman's trust, and we earned his family's trust in us. I talked with him a couple days ago, and he said, you know, for three years I've had this left-sided weakness. Nobody ever bothered to, to do a CT scan and find out what was going on. I was in this hospital for six days. No one bothered to find out what was going on. So when we look at drivers of patient satisfaction, the most important driver is nursing communication and the responsiveness to that patient's needs when he is in the hospital. 
Of course, physician communication complements that tremendously. We cannot do anything without the physician's order. But if we're not saying the same thing at the, at the time to that family and to the patient, we lose their trust. So it's critical, whether it's an electronic medical record or whatever we're looking at, that we are on the same page uh, dealing with that patient. Across the country, about 79% of the time, uh, the patient believes that the nurse has uh, treated that patient with courtesy and respect, uh, explained things in a way that they understand, and listen to them. So what do you think happens to the other 20% of the patients that haven't had that uh, good uh, interaction with their, patient, their nurse or their physician? They're ending up back in the emergency department, they're readmitted to the hospital, or they are seeking uh, additional health care resources, unfortunately, uh, where they don't have a blue button and we don't know what's going on with them. We really are uh, at a, a disadvantage in our uh, current patient care. Often we think that technology is going to be the solution to improving care, but there is so much more that we need to get out. So to earn this patient's trust, it requires more than technology. We really need to be communicating the technology that we use with our patients. It's too late to respond to a single patient need once they've been discharged from the hospital. So we really need to, uh, whether they're in a physician's office or if they're a hospitalized patient, respond in real time to those issues that they are having and answer those questions. We do have patient portals that we can use to communicate with that patient. However, we've got to be doing something more uh, interactive and quick, whether it's uh, interactive patient education where we're able to real time assess the level of knowledge that that patient has, uh, rounding using iPad technology to uh, push out requests, whether it's as simple as um, my dietary needs were not being met in the hospital and we push that out to dietary so that they can immediately respond to that patient, or if it's regarding does this patient uh, need, will this patient be scheduled for surgery at 7 p.m. I was uh, speaking to a kidney transplant patient a few months ago, and he was so excited to know that his kidney was working. He, would, he just was grinning ear to ear. And he was trying to recite to me what his creatinine levels were to sh show me that he was really engaged in understanding what was going on with his, his new friend, his kidney. And uh, he was squinting across the room at his communication board where the nurse had put all of his creatinine levels down. And I said, well, has anyone showed you on the, your electronic medical record what it looks like in a graph? And he said, no. So I pulled up the, the computer next to his bedside, clicked on creatinine level, and voila, it graphs out his creatinine. He was so jazzed. We had uh, opened up this secret door. You know, people don't always think they can see what's going on in that computer. But he saw with his own eyes that his kidney friend was now working. He was happy. To maintain trust, we can use technology not only to diagnose and treat, but um, we also can get instant feedback uh, on our patients as well as our staff's engagement in the care that day. We began piloting a staff and patient engagement feedback uh, technology, a tool, in our women's and children's services recently. And based on aggregate data from a three-month period of time, uh, we identified that on Thursdays, our staff were sad faces. 
And so when we went back to the staff and asked them, why is it a sad face day on Thursday? What's going on? They said, Thursday is the busiest day. We have a lot of procedures going on with these itty bitty two and three pound babies, high anxiety with the families. We're just um, at our wit's end. So what they did was they realigned the staffing for Thursdays so that we could better meet our families' anxiety needs as well as work with the procedural issues with the physicians. So I'm a, a baby boomer. How many of you remember mood rings? <laughs> this is kind of like a mood ring. You know, if, if, uh, probably in the 80s, if we all had mood rings on us, nurses and physicians, we could have said, oh, it's a good day, or nope, not a good day. So I think of this new technology as a way for us to judge the mood of our staff as well as our patients. So how do we respond to the speed of trust? We can balance technology with compassion. We need to look at our culture of caring and, and uh, really push for that transparency so that patients don't think that their electronic medical record on the computer is this secret tool that we're working with. Show them the results of their CT scan. Show them what they found during surgery. Uh, I talk about uh, the need for our staff to balance their IQ with their EQ. Uh, there's a, a critical need for emotional intelligence at the bedside in healthcare. And part of our generational transitions that we're seeing, we're losing some of that uh, emotional intelligence. We're, we're great with the tech side, but we've got to balance it out. Secondly, we need to monitor patient engagement, uh, whether it's real time, and then recover that service uh, before they've left, or we do it after the visit or after discharge, as we're doing with um, our patient satisfaction surveys across the country. And we look at that data on an aggregate level and identify those trends and opportunities for improvement. Third, we need to communicate. We've got to listen. We've got to understand what our patients are saying. As somebody said earlier, I trust my doctor because they listen to me. That's probably the most technologically advanced tool that we have on us is our brain. Assume nothing regardless of the generational or educational uh, competencies of your staff and, and your patients. Understand that um, they may not be getting what you're saying or a picture's worth a thousand words. Show them a picture. And finally, under-promise and over-deliver. I'm a real advocate for, uh, you know, if you go to a restaurant and you're, you ask how long will the wait be, and they say 15 minutes, but 45 minutes later you're at the bar and you don't want to eat anymore, that you lose your trust in that restaurant. Same thing in, in healthcare. If you're going to do surgery at 7 a.m. tomorrow morning, you better darn toot and do that. Uh, otherwise, you're losing your trust of your patients and the families. Finally, um, a dose of reality. Um, we always expect it's going to be a smooth road ahead. It isn't always that way. But ultimately, we get to um, the, the finish line. UC Irvine Medical Center has been working on their patient satisfaction for a long time, um, working with transparency with our patients, et cetera. <coughs> And we are now one of the top 20 academic medical centers in the nation with overall patient satisfaction. So um, we're, we're working to meet our patients uh, and their families' needs. Technology is helping us get there, but listening to our patients will keep us there. Thank you. Uh, we've talked, everyone's kind of mentioned trust, and, and uh, Mary had a slide on maintaining trust, but, but from each of your perspective, what really is trust in healthcare, and, and how do you get it, and how do you lose it? Well, how do you get a philosophy major in college? Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I think one of the interesting things is, 
um, there, there needs to be a reason that people exchange information. Um, and I think the work that's been, you know, that you've seen here is fantastic. Um, but very often, um, you know, for the average person, and we've been saying the word patient a lot, um, and I, I use the word consumer more often because a few of us are actually patients most of the time. Most of us are healthcare consumers, and we need to know about what's going health, and sometimes we're patients, and then the rest of the time we're just regular people again. Um, we need a reason to be engaged in, in this exchange of information. We need a reason to, um, to share information. We need a reason to download information. How many of you have a personal health record? How many of you have commercial insurance? So I, I would posit all of you with commercial insurance actually have a personal health record. You just don't use it. Right? You don't use it because you don't want to. You don't use it because you might not have a reason to. You might not feel a reason to. You might not use it because you're not incentive to. Um, so to engage in this issue of trust, means that you need some reason to, to do it in the first place. Um, that um, not just necessarily accountable um, for your own outcome, but you're actually engaged in your outcome. And therefore, you, you want to seek out someone you can trust. And you, you mentioned that relationship and reason to do it. It's, I keep bringing up dating. I don't know why. Um, um, it is very much like the, that sort of relationship. How much do you want to share and why and for what reason? How long do you expect to be in that relationship? And what do you expect to get out of that? Um, if it's uh, going to be something very you know, cursory, then you, you don't invest a lot of yourself in it. Um, and you don't, um, you don't necessarily do the same sort of betting that you would of the, of the, uh, of the other individuals. It's so, going to be much more important and you get much more engaged. So how do you lose trust then? Well, I mean, it's easy to lose trust. And you know, as we talked about, you know, um, as you mentioned, I mean, if, you, if you tell someone you're going to do surgery at 7 and, and you're late for surgery for any number, Right? People don't want to trust you. But ironically, it goes back to the service experience. You have terrible service. I mean, a lot of people will drive a long way to go to a, a big name institution believing that they will get better care. And they'll put up with bad service because they think they're getting some you know, mystique of quality. And we find in these transparency efforts that, of course, that, um, that many local places provide much better care for, for lots of different um, uh, conditions. It's the restaurant you'll spend three hours in the bar for, and you get the same food. But it's in the restaurant, so it's like um, I'm, I'm staying in uh, uh, over by our office. Uh, there's a Scott's restaurant, seafood place. Have you ever been there? Oh, yeah. Good place, yeah. yeah. Well, I know, I mean, I can go on, on my, my phone, and I could go to Scott's, or I could go to Red Lobster. Every Red Lobster, every Sunday. Right? Right? Um, and then I would know what I'm getting. Right? I know what the price would be, I know what the quality they can expect, I know what the omics, I know what social media would tell me about what the experience was like. Um, you can do that in healthcare. Um, and what we have is these little bits of information, some of the transparency, sort of pockets of information that we can try and draw some conclusion from. Leslie, any other thoughts on, on what trust is and how it comes and goes? I do think that you do have to have a common ground and you have to believe that each other is out, is, is helping each other um, achieve your best interest. So we actually do some wonderful research that Deloitte has done uh, in six consumer segments of healthcare. We have a look at it straight uh, at the National E-Health Collaborative. We've been using that work to take patients and uh, people in the industry and business people, we interviewed about 200 folks, and ask them to align with the motives of, of the people represented in the study. And we've asked them questions about how they feel, think, experience, uh, and, and what they are hoping for in healthcare between their provider, their electronic health record, their hospital, and their health education. And we have found that a common theme across these segments is, can I trust you? Do you have my back? Will it cost more or less? What are my choices? And fundamentally, uh, when we make choices in any other industry, we just know the risks and benefits, we know the costs, we have an understanding of what the service experience is that we choose to have, and we engage in decision. And in healthcare, we have very few of those things. So we come at it with this hopefulness, but not necessarily trust. And as we become more cynical with many of the security breaches and many of the, the campaigns of trust of, of government and healthcare right now, 
um, that actually gets wider. And, and our hopefulness becomes missing. So we really have to address this, this fundamental trust issue. Mary, you, you've already talked about maintaining trust. So tell us from, from your experiences here, how do you lose trust? And then what do you do to get it back? You lose trust when you don't um, follow through on what you said you were going to do. Um, or you lose trust when you have taken them down one path that you think the diagnosis is, and suddenly it's deflected in another direction. Like this gentleman that I mentioned, who for years probably was saying, something's not right on the left side of my head my left side of my body, right side of my brain. And uh, no one listened to him. So he's lost trust in that institution. But I also see that um, so many patients today come very prepared with, uh, they've Googled, they've WebMD, they've gone to the Mayo Clinic uh, site. And so they think they've identified what is going on with them. And so they, they walk in and they fully expect, there's a basic expectation that they already want. They're, you're not gonna earn their trust with just basics. You almost have to wow them and identify that, um, what's really, you know, listen to what they said, but take it to that next level. I was uh, speaking with a physician who I was commending him for his patience and listening to this family who really felt like they knew exactly what was going on with um, this condition. And he said, you know, Mary, it's great that they know what they think is going on with this, um, this patient and their condition, because it's my job to know the 4,000 other diagnoses that I need to rule out. So he was very acknowledge, acknowledging the fact that this patient had researched. That is homework. Uh, I, I'm, how many of you have heard the expression, uh, privacy is the right to be left alone? Never heard that? Uh, how many of you know when that was actually written originally? How many years ago? 1890 by a, a law student who would later become uh, uh, Louis Brandeis, one of the Supreme Court justices, was written in the uh, Harvard uh, Law Review, and it was had to do with uh, new technology, oddly enough. The Brownie camera had just come out, and uh, photographers and journalists were walking <coughs> up and down the streets taking pictures of people. Oh my God, that's horrible. Uh, but now, uh, Everyone's got a camera. It isn't just the reporting journalists. You got it on your phone. So uh, we've covered pri uh, trust. Let, let's turn to privacy now. What does privacy mean in this day of anywhere, anytime connection in in, in healthcare? <coughs> Sorry once again. But privacy is interesting. I, I mentioned earlier that you know people are concerned about you know, individual pieces of information, and um, but. We, uh, when you look at a lot of the movement in healthcare right now, it's about sharing information. Um, and there's, there's a recognition that the more people know, the better your care can be. Um, if you look at uh, in the cancer community, for example, if, uh, or patients like me, other sort of websites where people share information, um, they get a lot of great in, uh, information, a lot of support around there. And so the thought of, there, there's, there's a, there's a, if I can share things with a white community, I can actually get a lot from that. Now contrast that with, for every patient who's going in for um, chemotherapy in an infusion center down the street um, and checking in on Facebook and all their friends are liking it, there's a guy showing up at an STD clinic with multi-drug resistant gonorrhea. That guy's not checking in on Facebook. <laughs> um, and um, so we have an issue where there are very closely held pieces of information that people don't want to share that they, that they want to know that this very small circle that I share this information with is going to protect that information the same way that I, as an individual, would want it protected. And I think that's the struggle we have of being able to 
balance often the, the conflicting the conflicting interests of individuals to have information shared versus information protected, and the, the benefit they can derive from either sharing it or protecting it, and, and knowing the difference. It's a big issue. You know, uh, we think about privacy is like art. I know it when I'll see it. Um, and to a large extent, that is. That is absolutely true. Um, but it's also interesting, your first point, about the burden to share. And actually, there's some research we've done in England right now that says that really it, it should be a principal tenet of medicine. That as a patient, that the provider has a burden to share when it advantages my health. <coughs> And folks don't talk about that. So there is a, a yin and a yang and a tension between these things. Now, perhaps that should be up to me as a patient to say, I want to exercise uh, my rights in sharing information. And I want you to have a bias in, in sharing information to benefit my health. But today, we have very little involvement that say, how many of you read and noticed the privacy practices? Yeah, actually, they're horrible. I don't sign. I, I sign none. <coughs> the last hospital I was in for my mother, it said they had the right to use my mother's image for any marketing. Oh they had used. They had the right to use her information for any fundraising. They had the right to um, photograph her in any way, shape, or form in the hospital. So you were at Google image. Hospital. <laughs> you were at Google Hospital. <laughs> <laughs> and it was very interesting because this was their notice of privacy practices. And I said, I refuse to sign it. And they said, well, if you refuse to sign it, refuse to use hair. And I said, you need to get chief legal counsel on the phone. Because I will sue you. Uh, the, actually, the biggest fine ever given so far by Office of Civil Rights on HIPAA has been $4 million to use cardiac group for not sharing the medical record. <coughs> so that really has been a more financial burden uh, proven to be it's the actual refusal to share with the patient. So it's, it's, a big, it's a big deal. Mary, you've got the patient experience. So what do you tell patients when they say, are you protected my privacy? What does that mean to them? I think it's implied when they're there. I, I, I am by no means an expert on the privacy piece, but we certainly have compliance officers that are breathing down our necks all the time, making sure that anything we do is hyper compliant with um, the expectations of our patients, whether it is dealing with our patient portal and not um, and making sure that we are not misutilizing the portal for other purposes. Uh, one of the it, things I was thinking of as you all were talking was uh, we were wanting our rooms and our new moms to share uh, with their families the new babies. And so we have these iPads, you know, and we've got FaceTime. <coughs> and wouldn't that be really neat if we could have the mom show the family, you know, what's going on at the hospital or the siblings? Well, we can't do that according to our compliance officer, because it might be uh, misused. So those are the, the, the realities of privacy. Now, uh, actually, I have a lot more questions. Uh, but as I was going through my questions, I realized that they were all kind of from my perspective. And almost 28 years in the provider space, I, I have a little bit of bias. So I actually went and told uh, people I know who are either patients or caregivers for uh, elderly parents or are dealing with a lot of these issues on their own and, and they don't understand the privacy issues and, and security. So I'm gonna ask you just to respond to some of the uh, stuff I got back. Uh, and we're gonna start with Mary this time. Uh, and it's probably an appropriate question. One, one person, I, I sent out my question, what would you like to know? What would you ask if you had these people in front of you? And the response was, why should I as a patient care about this? It just means or sounds like bureaucracy to me. Privacy is not a real concern to me in most cases. It's implied that your health care is going to be private. 
course, when you go to Target, it's implied that your credit card's going to So you you don't you, you, that in an issue is is that a, when when you do your surveys or, or press game whatever you're using you ask about privacy. Is there a question of privacy? Not uh, not an HCAPS question. Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, Leslie. Privacy of the concern to me in those cases, which supports what you've been saying. I think it is in the eyes of the beholder, and I get to decide what's private or not. Why should I care? I think I'll care uh, if I'm well, less than I'll care if I'm sick. And perhaps a condition might be sensitive to me, may not be sensitive to you. I get to choose. Um, I do also feel, though, there is an extreme on that. Um, when we are trying to dissect the data as, and to actually, there's a movement to actually split apart our data in such a way that we as a patient can get to a very detailed and granular level to say, I don't want this shared. I do not, you cannot predetermine as, as a patient or even a provider what information is necessary for the provider to save your life when you show up in emergency. So we do have to have both an implied and implicit and an explicit level of trust uh, in, in the data in our care. Uh, but if there's a natural tension, as, as here's a, it's just a natural tension, and it's going to be messy for a while. <coughs> I think privacy is important when it becomes important to you. Yeah. Um, and you know, for a lot of people, they don't care about a lot of things until suddenly they care about them. Mm -hmm. um, and you have a reason to care about it. Um, where suddenly you're diagnosed with um, uh, with cancer, or, or something simple, say you, you get low back pain. I mean, not many of us have you know manual labor jobs, but if you have a job where you, you have a pre-existing condition of low back pain, you're kind of unlikely to get that job. You know? And there's a lot of discrimination. It's a lot of these um, mental illness. You know, the one. A lot of misunderstanding too. Um, uh, of, of sort of the, the thing that people imply from the data that you have. That you, you know, people worry about, you know, someone might misconstrue this information. Um, that, you know, I got treated for one thing. Uh, a lot of time, uh, uh, chronic pain syndromes um, in, uh, in, in legs are treated with antidepressants. You don't worry about someone thinking they're on antidepressants because they have depression um, and how that might influence it. Or they might be afraid that someone else might find out about that. Um, you've got a lot of reproductive issues as well, which, um, you know, there's a lot of sensitivities down there. So, um, you know, it's it's one thing to poll people about, you know, are you concerned about it versus polling people who are actually concerned about it and what their concerns are. And I think that's where you get a, a big difference. And actually, people who are more active in care are less concerned about privacy than people who are not active. That's interesting. Uh, here's here's a, another one. I, I, I think this will resonate with you, Harry. Uh, when you talk about trust in healthcare, I think you mean my doctor. I don't think of my insurance company as part of my health care, so I don't think about trust issues. But I trust my doctor with my information more than I trust my insurance company. But now we're being forced to share all this information. The continuum of care isn't just providers anymore. Well, it was funny because most people don't appreciate that. I mean, the first thing is they're not because of the insurance company. Um, it's like, oh, I'll tell you because don't tell the insurance company. The insurance company knows that. Right? Um, and the insurance company knows more about it. So they often have a more complete picture of where you've gotten care, what you've done, what prescription you filled, what prescription you haven't filled. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, the, the under, I think most people don't understand the extent that their, um, where their information goes, how it gets used, who's protecting it, who's not protecting it. Um, and I mean, it's not a misunderstanding, too, about the difference between having electronic information versus paper information. Because a lot of people think that you know, electronic information is going to expose them to all sorts of uh, horrors. Um, now, for sure, you know, information in electronic form can be subject to an audit trail. And you can um, you can have role-based access to records. Uh, you walk into any hospital and they have paper records. Anyone who picks up the chart has the chart. You can't say, oh, you, because your report card can only look at the following six pages. Um, uh, and uh, you know, we have the ability for people to understand who's been accessing the records and in what circumstances. So, uh, you know, there's, there are a lot of factors that go into that. Um, and, you know, this, 
this is, I think there's so much fundamental misunderstanding of how information gets moved around in healthcare. The other thing that's kind of funny is that most people believe that doctors communicate with each other. <laughs> and, then, and then it's like, you know, you go to one doctor and then they send you to another doctor, then when you go to that other doctor, they know all about you, or when that doctor goes to the hospital, also knows about you. It's just not true. Um, so, um, you know, we have you know, layer upon layer of misunderstanding, which is confusing, and then Britney Spears gets admitted to an emergency room, and all of a sudden her records get hacked, and all of a sudden, oh, privacy is a big concern now. Um, so, uh, you know, I would say it's a complicated world, but, you know, healthcare is very complicated, um, and the information that gets moved around, who has access to it, and who's generating it, um, has expanded just so dramatically, um, you know, in the last few decades, um, that uh, I think it's hard for the average person to even get a you know, analog. You, you've been talking about the flows and who gets it and where it's generated and how many hands it has to go through. Uh, and, and then you get a response like this, I don't even think of the insurance company as part of healthcare. So, so Leslie, is, I mean, there's an education component, but as we bring these pieces together, I know you're looking at it, how do we tr train not only the organizations that have to share it, but the people who, are, who it is about to understand some of those flows and complexity? Well, I think there needs to be transparency, not just to the data of who's had access. Now, in the provider setting, you often see a provider can look and see who look at their record or their patient's record. And generally, when you educate a group and you say, hey, you can go and see who's looked at your record, the cardiac surgeons who are looking at their other partner's patients stops. Um, you see competitors stop looking at each other's because at any time, someone can look at their record and say, I see who's look at that record and they sell police. So could that be taken to the patients where the patient might see employee one, two, three, four, five, six has looked at my record and employee seven, eight, nine, ten are, and my care, care team might be all groups of employee number beginning with number ten. Who knows what that might be? But at some point in time that transparency helps to separate me. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure how it evolves. Mary, I've got one for you that, that we, you mentioned baby boomers, so this was a response. I hear a ton about privacy when on the phone and in person, but I have a power of attorney for my mom, and I've been able to set up online user access, such as a patient portal or insurance company user accounts, as her and as myself for her without ever having to prove that I am her or that I have permission to do it for her. How do you deal with the portal? Well, let you see her, honey. Dad doesn't have it. Let me tell you. <laughs> it, uh, it's, there are checks and balances that we put in place so that if uh, there's that request, we have to validate it um, through our health information management uh, team. So we do, we do that check and balance. Are there times when it gets through there? Probably. But we for instance, I am uh, with my mom. I have the portal set up for my mom. I had to sign a consent. She had to sign it with me so that we could have access. So I, I think that uh, it's very difficult to do. So you, uh, Leslie, you mentioned levels of assurance and stuff. I'm, I'm presuming that this will apply to that as well as just the direct record? Yes, we, we have to understand how identity management works uh, for all of us who are participating in order us to have parity in the digital age for each group. We have to be confident in people that are who they say they are. Unless it's trying to get our attention. I'm looking at the time. Are you ready? Okay. We'll, we'll, I, I have paid this question. We'll go ahead. Oh, no, any, who, who had a question over here right next to you, Leslie? Uh, it sounds, it sounds like we're in a period of transition to me uh, as far as this trust issue. Uh, I can remember when I didn't trust my mechanic, and I didn't ask for an instruction then. But now we're saying now for me to get better health care, I need my health record. In other words, the presumption being that 
I can trust my own advocacy more than I can entrust my physician who is trained to give me care without an advocate. So I guess what I'm thinking after listening to you, the panel, is that we're in a transition period. We're in a period where in uh, where just like I used to did not ask for uh, you know, I don't ask for an instruction manual when I take my car to a mechanic. Uh, maybe this is a question, are we in a transition period to where I don't need my health care record right, to assure that I'm getting good treatment? I mean, that is a, a measure of trust that uh, sounds like is not available at this time. That's a good question, and I didn't get a user manual, so I'm going to go back to the rule I, I, I would like, when, when we're asking these questions, I'd like to know uh, your name and where you're from. So can we come back? Yeah, and then we're going to address the user manual issue. I'm Joe Carey with the Memorial Care. Yes, sir. Gary, the, the, the mechanic now is a great one because if you ever gotten your, your car inspected, you know, the garage, they say, you know, well, you've got 60 millimeters of wear on your, on your brake rubbers. Like, Was that good? I don't know. Um, and so the, the sort of thought that just by giving people information, they're going to be able to make better decisions. Um, this is not... It's, it, it hasn't been shown that that level of information um, actually can generate better care. They may be more informed, they can help people ask more questions, but often if, they, if you ask more questions, you get answers and you don't know what that answer means. We really get to the point where we understand, again, um, you know, when we have enough information to say that where can I find a, a doctor who can provide high quality care um, at, a, at a price I can afford in a respectful manner um, for me. Um, and that taking that data about me, that someone said, you know, this is, a, this is my information, this is the doctor's information, this is the hospital's information, that I can get that kind of care. Um, you know, I live, in, I live in Washington, D.C. I can find that information on the right snowblower uh, based on my zip code. I don't feel the issue here. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I, I couldn't find a, a doctor who did a, a knee autopsy beyond me that, you know, that had a good, that I, I could find that kind of information. I knew what was wrong with me, I knew what I'd done, but I couldn't tell where it was the right place to go. So you're right, it's a transition. Um, it's a matter of getting the, enough information about you and enough information about health care to be able to make better decisions and need that analytics layer in between to help people make better decisions. It sounds like patient engagement. Yeah, I, and I would also somewhat disagree. I, I, I don't think that it's the doctor's right or the patient's right. I think together they're much better and likely to achieve right because you listen to the patient goals and listen to the physician's evidence and you have a much likely put of success. Um, but we are transitioning from a high degree of perhaps ignorance in both camps of perhaps the provider not understanding the patient's point of view and the patient not understanding the provider's expertise and evidence. So it's not a right or wrong, it's a collaboration that needs to occur. Now, when you collaborate with your mechanic, and you come in knowing what a catalytic converter is, you have a higher degree of not being ripped off when he starts to describe the catalytic converter malfunction. So it doesn't mean that I ever want to be an expert on catalytic converters, but I do know they're quite expensive. And so when they are, have to be addressed, I try to look them up and understand them. I don't want to get my fingers dirty. I like my nails the way they are. <laughs> but I do want to be informed so that I won't be taken advantage of and I have a higher degree of trust. Hi, um, my name is Pam Steinitz and I'm with P Vector Marketing. I'd like to um, ask the panel to comment um, not just on patient engagement, but incentives that lead to patient engagement. And I can see that, uh, especially under um, the new healthcare law is that um, physicians are going to be incented for positive outcomes. And of course, having patient engagement, um, I think, can lead to positive outcomes because you have the participation. But what I, I see the incentives for the providers, but I don't see where the incentives are, I mean, to move forward 
as much for the patients in terms of patient engagement. And I think the panel could comment on that. I appreciate it. So, um, you know, starting off again, so I, mean, I, I wear a fuel band. How many people have a Fitbit or fuel band? Right. So, do you like exercise? No, you don't. So I, 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 I'm ashamed into exercising by this, because my friends know what I'm exercising. Other industries have figured out how to get us to do things that we don't want to do. Right? They've been very good at that. They haven't been beating us over the head and stuff. They haven't been punishing us. They found ways to get us to, you know, to fly a certain airline, shop at a certain grocery store, to stay at a certain hotel chain. Um, and they've given us value from that. And healthcare has ignored that for, for ages. We just had really no reason to. Um, but now suddenly as we're going into this um, you know, value-based uh, value uh, uh, care and, uh, or uh, value-based reimbursement and outcomes-based reimbursement, suddenly you know, doctors and hospitals care about what happens to you on the outside, how well you do. So they're judged on, on, on your overall recovery, which means they need to find ways to engage people. So we're, we're finding ways that other industries have been able to engage people. We've shown in the past that by simply you know, giving people more financial responsibility for their care, we thought that was a great way to get them more engaged. No, all that does is give them to skip care and not enough money. Right? Show them over and over again. Um, and if we don't give people enough information and tools to do that, so I think it's, we're, we're coming to a very exciting era of innovation around patient engagement, patient incentives, gamification, lot, you know, use of social media, lots of very cool things that other industries have used to get people to do stuff. Um, in a way that gets a much more engaged in healthcare, and now healthcare is getting interested in doing that because they have to be. Hi, I'm Jen Jen Chen. I'm from UCI in Miller Children's Hospital Pediatrics Pulmonary. So, um, I don't know how to ask this question without sounding like a total jerk, but with the caveat that I understand that my patients and their parents and their families are the essential resource for taking care of them, how do we balance maintaining trust with these patients with the caveat of that study that came out of Davis where they looked at patient satisfaction with increased mortality, increased drug uh, prescriptions, etc. How do we balance that with the pressure on maintaining good outcomes and not coming back to the hospital, with the patients having maybe too much information about their electronic medical records and what have you, and focusing, and some of them actually have tonal vision, where they focus on one number to the detriment of their own health. So how do I, I guess, as a physician, say, I'm doing what's best for you, but in the case that they, I still want to maintain trust, that they don't really understand or listen. I just wanted to get your perspective on that. So the fundamental mistake we made as physicians is to believe there's, what, there's what's right, right? And it's what the patient wants. And that has always been based upon a, um, uh, a great inequity in the amount of information available to both parties. So, you know, you know, we found, for example, you know, in pediatrics, right? That, you know, parents now understand the issue of ovaries and antibiotics. They didn't understand that before. We educated them. Now they understand when you say, you know what, you don't get antibiotics, they go, okay, that's fine, I'm good with that. Um, and so many, many conditions are like that. But the more patients understand about why and what their outcomes are going to be, the more likely they are to accept something um, that may not have been what they originally wanted. Now the flip side of that is we as physicians have been terrible at understanding what patients want. Right? So for example, take prostate cancer. Not, not something you treat very often. Um, <laughs> that, you know, there are like 50 different ways of treating prostate cancer, right? From medical retributive prostatectomy to robot surgery to watchful waiting. And, you know, if you ask patients what they want, what's important to them, some will say, I never want to get cancer again. Some people say, I want to maintain sexual function. Other people say, I want to get back to work in two days, right? And, you know, the outcomes are slightly different, but what's important to them is different. So we, as physicians, haven't had a good way of understanding what's very important to the patients. Patients haven't had a good enough understanding of how we come to decisions. And by sharing that information in a much more collaborative way, we can actually get to a much better place. Yeah, 
because Dara completed a study on patient generated health data and uh, talked about patient input. And Ugart Dartmouth, Geisinger, Beth Israel, uh, Kaiser, along with about five community hospitals, and they talked about this. And the, the physicians came to this hearing admitting that they were quite skeptical. The patient's going to lie, they're not going to hear all this information, they're going to waste my time, why don't they do, do what I say? And all of them who had actually participated in patient generated health data and interacting with the patients through messaging online came to the conclusion they were better doctors. What they found was they knew the med list better, what the patient was actually taking. This was a new data point. They, looked, they talked about not data reconciliation, which is what we provide a lot to talk about. They talked about curate, curating data. And this is a new data point that's coming from the patient that complements the other data point. And the patients actually can do their own observations, provide their own results, provide their own impressions, because they are the patient. And the, the physician said, as we started to get over our biases and to interact with the patient, they had surprising information. Again, the medications were, were better. They knew it was about drugs that the patient was taking. But what they also found is patients who were newly diagnosed with chronic disease that often stopped taking the drugs six months later and they had a lot of patients that just not taking them to see the difference. Because they were interacting with, with the patient on a more ongoing basis, either they're, they're themselves or their nurse or their coach, they were able to find depression six months earlier in chronic drugs and actually find out when they stop being compliant with the drug is because often something else is happening, like the onset of depression, the realization that they were actually in a chronic disease state and need to participate in the management of that. So it was interesting because each of the providers came very skeptical and each of them walked away feeling that they had offered now better care. So I think it's a matter of inviting people in um, in terms they understand. And really, providers are the guests at the patient or the person's table. No, they're not the guests at their table. And, and it's a totally different mindset. There, are, there was a question on the hospital uh, patient satisfaction survey, uh, both for physicians and for nurses, and it says, um, the doctor explained things in a way I understood, or the nurse explained things in a way I understood, and probably seven out of 10 understand what the doctor or the nurse are saying. So I think the, the key thing, especially when we look at today's generations, that we um, use the <coughs> tools that we have, technology, to explain things to patients, and answer that question, why? Why do I have to have this vaccine for my child? Because this, and, and be willing to go into that uh, extra level of understanding for your patients. Let me just add one last thing. I mean, I did a lot of these kind of fora where people talk about, you know, awesome patient empowerment. And one said, you know, I am a doctor. Um, and I did spend a lot of time learning these things. <laughs> and, and, you know, when I, um, if you do a patient satisfaction survey, and right before, you, oh, you have cancer, how was your stay? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so satisfied. Um, but the, what I've come to appreciate in, in speaking to a lot of, a, a lot of people and, and, and a lot of organizations is that um, there's a fallacy in medicine that by coming up with a, you know, a perfect treatment plan in an institution, that's going to yield a great outcome. We've shown over and over again, it doesn't. And you, I'm sure you have the same experience. You do a wonderful things with the kids with asthma and all, all sorts of other things. And here's your, you know, inhaler regimen, blah blah blah. And they come in a month later, no better than they were, right? And and that's what we're trying to fix. Is that that gap? Is what we're trying to pull here. Hi, I'm Ginger Conrad, and I come from the world of social media community building outside of the healthcare industry actually. But I have a question that relates to what we learned a couple weeks ago from the art of social listening. And then Dr. Greenspun mentioned how the government has been 
you know, listening via social media and whatnot. And then I just uh, saw a tweet today regarding baby boomers and the fact that, you know, there are 38 to 42 percent baby boomers out there that are on social media. And actually one out of five baby boomer is going to social media to, as a source for health care. So what is the healthcare industry doing? Um, are you listening to social media? Do you have programs in place in the future that will kind of address you know, those baby boomers and future generations? Patients like me has proven to be a huge and powerful source of information. Um, not just with patients helping each other, but actually providing great research and outcomes that providers are starting to listen to. And they will report things like a total knee replacement, which hospital was better than the other, which procedure was used versus another, which doctor was old school or new school, uh, in huge amounts of numbers. And so it cannot be ignored for looking at your market. If you're a marketing leader in a hospital, patients like me is a huge opportunity to look. Now, the privacy inhibit issue always stops things. Because we think as a provider, as a prior former CIO, you know, it was very, I wanted everyone to get on, on this, but that information couldn't easily be shared. Now, with this new uh, blue button technology, we'll actually be putting forward the same kinds of technology that allows the patient to consent and say, yes, I want this shared with this app, register this app, and download it. That could be patients like me. That could be healthvault.com. That could be no more clipboard, that could be epic, that could be my Excel spreadsheet. And that leakages, which actually ask the patient to be deliberate in naming where that information goes, then overcomes many of the privacy issues because the patient is the one who's stating it. Now, do we often check the box and say, yes, we do? And so that education around the use of that data will have to be um, actually elevated uh, at a little, little bit higher, a lot higher. Um, but to most cases, social media has been used uh, to do marketing campaigns and not necessarily in active in care. Mayo has, or excuse me, John Hopkins has done a great job with using social media with patient consent. Say, how do you feel about things? And they're using it for customer recovery. They're using Facebook for patient recovery. And so they will invite patients to sign up um, and join the site when they leave the hospital and those patients that choose to and interact that way will be responded to by a health coach, if it's a clinical question, and start to actually advocate a sort of patients like me uh, situation for John Hawkins. They've done a really great job with that. But most are shying away from it from the Mayo issue. I think that this will be overcome quite quickly. Well, when it's for social media, I mean, it's, it's so much is user generated. Right, so I forget the health people right now, right, the health systems, right? right? It's, it's, it's individuals doing it. Um, and it's kind of double-edged sword. On one hand, you have the ability to share a lot of very valuable information. The flip side is that I mentioned earlier, so when you ask consumers about the quality of care, you get service experience. Mm -hmm. right? um, and so when, in, in no disrespect, but you know, a lot of times we say, what's the best place to get something done? The best place to get something done is often the nicest place to get something done, the friendliest place as opposed to the best outcomes. And we're obviously trying to get to a place where the best place is also the friendliest place and the nicest place. Um, but uh, you know, if you look at Angie's Quest, you look at health breaks, you look at a lot of different things, these are judging health professionals on, on their service experience as opposed to their outcomes. We need to get to a place, I go back to the sort of Red Lobster or Scott's comparison, the sort of the Zagat's guy where you actually have you have real publicly available validated data on outcomes, which says, you know, this place does a great job, um, and this is what it's going to cost, you know, what it's, you know, what the, what the value is, and then you throw in the social media aspect, and this is what the experience is like to go there, because for some people, they want a very business-like place, other people want to bring their herbalist in and do a lot of other things there, um, and, the, you know, that's how they want to heal, and you need to know that. Um, but to, you know, the reliance on social media can be very, very dicey. The other thing, though, is even going back to the thing about the exercise part, is that social media is shown to be much more effective than almost anything else in getting people to, to change. Right? So if you, you know, the, the, the fuel bands of Fitbits are 
you know, the, the you know, tenth generation from, uh, from you know, uh, pedometers. People wear pedometers for about two weeks and then throw them away. Imagine the number that goes away. When you make it automatic, they're more likely to share goals. When you make it social, where there's a leaderboard, there's gamification, there's competition, uh, people are ten times more likely to reach their goals. So that's where the, I think that's where we're going to see the real impact on improving health care is, is leveraging that to, to improve outcomes. I also think we don't have the easy buttons on care. And, you know, I want to enter my symptoms on my phone. Do I need to go see the doctor today? Yes or no? Is it acute? Yes, no. yes, it is. You need to see the doctor. It knows where I am, what health plan I'm on, what my preferred physicians are, their hours of business. I could schedule an appointment. It compares against that physician's appointment schedule, schedules the appointment based upon my GIS score, and gets me in. When I arrive at the, patient's, at the physician's office, they have my symptom checker. They know my insurance information, all of my biases, values, preferences for care, and my insurance there and my copay. My credit card information at HSA are on file. I walk in. That physician, perhaps, now is called away. Guess what happens? The calendar gets updated, and I get a text message, and it says, your appointment's been moved. Can you accept that 15 minutes later? Yes or no. So we have nothing easy. Now, so if every, that that's, it's for me. <laughs> and and it's, it, part of it is the infrastructure to do that and being able to share that information. Um, that kind of easy button gets to the service experience. Now I put in there, well, my preferences uh, for this type of position, I want this schooling and this background, I want this effectiveness, and I want this average cost to be such and such. I don't have any of that. Now imagine if we did, what decisions would we make? All of the technology exists in pieces and parts to do that today. But we have been moving at healthcare speed and not iPhone speed. And, and it will change because the demands of all of us will change it. We've got one more question back here. Uh, hello, my name is Nasha, and that was loud. Um, <laughs> I make software for a company called Cario, and we're very familiar with meaningful use and a lot of other government incentives. Um, my question is, in this discussion, it feels like we're kind of missing the point a little bit. Um, so comment number one is patients understand privacy in a different way, I think, now. Uh, we understand that we have information that's going to be shared. We just want to make sure that it's shared with the right person. And the um, things that we're doing now are really giving information to the patients, but they're really uh, ill-prepared to do things with them. So it's like saying every American should have a car. We have no road system for them to drive it on. Um, and so I was curious about what you feel like uh, needs to happen in order to um, make incentives to actually make reform to interconnect the information between um, people who are really in control of healthcare reform, which are our payers and employers, uh, they are really making decisions. If an insurer wants to uh, change behavior, they can change it lightning fast, <laughs> you know, compared to the way uh, even patients can today. So don't get any comments on that. So the interoperability that you speak of, I can just talk to some of the things that are coming forward. Uh, the, the blue button, which is the new download and transfer, is a big deal because it now comes down in a structured format that can be shared and interoperable with many different systems in a standardized way. That has been signed off not only by many, many, many providers, but Aetna, United, Optum, uh, the major insurers are downloading the claims in the same way. I think Aetna's at 3 million downloads. So that data begins to come down in a structured way that's interoperable from the claim side and the provider side. That's a good infrastructure change. Uh, secure email between providers to get information back and forth is a good infrastructure change. For the patients to enter the ecosystem, we need to be, have uh, the same level of digital trust and parity. That is emerging. Right now, it's, it's not there. Um, we interact with a physician digitally if we have a tethered PHR. Well, I don't really want my whole patient experience to be based upon my chart. It should be based upon an entire relationship management system. It might include social media. It might include the my chart information. But what we see forming is really a collaborative care model where you will see the electronic health record is just one input and one output. And the data structure and standards are being formed now for use in three to five years that will allow for a collaborative care platform to work with patients and their designated care team, as well as multiple EHRs. Um, and that will start to unleashing things. It, it's coming. Um, I'm optimistic. 
but uh, not fast enough. So I, you know, I'll, you know, I'll disagree with you only because I'm tired. Um, <laughs> and, uh, We're both at East Coast. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that, that you know, insurance companies should change your behavior like that. Well, I mean, the if you think about it, if you look at obesity, you look at smoking, you look at all these, you know, non-communicable diseases and the difficulty we've had as a nation to change this. These are not technology problems. These are very complex, socio-political, economic, and technology issues all wrapped into one. Yeah, we need new tools to make that happen. We need to, you know, there, these pieces have to put in place, but none of them are sufficient on their own. Um, the ability to give information, I mean, if we just give, just by giving people information, we were able to change behavior, all those warning labels on cigarette packets, right, would be very effective. I mean, it's not true. So, um, these are going to be key things in order to get people to understand how they work, to, you know, how they work together. I think what's going to be most interesting about this aspect is that the needs of individuals haven't changed that much. Right? I want to be healthy. Right? I want to be happy. Um, but because of how I see the rest of the world going and every other industry going, I know that I got up in the morning and I showed up at the airport and with my driver's license and a credit card, I wound up here. Right? Everyone knew where to take me. Right? That my expectations have changed. Uh, what does it mean to be a modern system um, and achieve the kind of things we've done? Healthcare is going to go through the same things. The same things you describe, all these kind of inter interconnected things, interoperability issues. These things will be solved just like other industries. It's all banking, solve it. Um, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the aviation industry, solve it. Lots of other things have done that. Um, um, because we have taken all the information everyone had and allowed them to share that in a meaningful way that allow them to get good information from it and act on it appropriately. I think that's where we need to go. That's why the technology is critically important, the social aspects are very important, the service aspects are very important, and they've all got to work together. Good evening. Thank you so much for uh, all the wonderful comments today. It's been very enlightening. Uh, my name is Doug Gim. I'm an interventional radiologist here at UC Irvine, I'm the chief of the division. But um, my comments is this, actually. You know, very, very interesting discussion, and of course, your physician, our physician, I think, pediatrician here, she spoke as well, and, and it's great that in our, in our country here, you know, we want to have collaborative health care, which is great. You know, in 2013, when they came out with the world ranking for health care, we ranked 17th in the nation among the wealthiest countries in the world, right? We're number 17, and we have probably the best infrastructure. We created the internet here. So what I'd like to know from you guys is, you know, we sometimes get hung up on certain buzzwords, you know, it, because we're kind of a marketing country, right? Meaningful use. We kind of take that and we run with it and we create elaborate apps and things like that because meaningful use, it sounds like it's something that we should be using and it sounds wonderful. Like, what a wonderful idea. Trust, oh my God, we should absolutely be talking about trust and developing more trust. But how does that actually translate to better healthcare? And that's kind of what I wanted to know. So when you look at the other countries that are 16 above us, what are they doing that have brought them up to that level compared to what, where we're at today? So if I could just have you guys comment on that, thank you. I think Denmark is a great example. Now, I often am reminded that it's the same size as Idaho, and probably <laughs> easier to manage than Idaho, so. Australia, you, Australia's number five, they're okay. a pretty big country. And, and there you go, vast, not population size. Yeah. And, so what they've done is put an emphasis on home care. And they said, we will build fewer hospital beds by 30% over the next five years. And we will drive more home health, we will drive more primary care, and we will, as a nation, somewhat dis displace hospitals. Now that's an approach. That's one approach. Now, do they, they can demonstrate much better outcomes in many different areas. Would we, as a, a nation, probably do that right now? I don't see it happening. Well, you know, they always say, you know, we have the health system that we create, right? Um, and so every country has that. Um, and so stuff that seems to make a lot of sense, uh, take telehealth, for example, right? Telehealth's been around since 1920s. Hasn't caught on the United States because there was no reimbursement problem that could make sense. You go to Shandong province in China, right? There's a telehealth center that serves 100 million people. Right? It just makes sense. Um, you're an interventional radiologist, right? If you want to count on your hand how many interventional radiologists there are 
in Morocco, right? Um, and you know, I was on a, a panel for how do you improve the health of people across North Africa. Um, you know, different models for how they give care, and also different expectations, different cultural expectations of what do you do at end of life? Um, what, you know, how are we going to manage um, a number of different diseases? What's your own responsibility to take care of stuff? In other countries where um, you know, families are responsible for taking care of individuals, um, that uh, you, you pay out of pocket for most care, you've got to save for that sort of thing. You know, there are very different incentives. So it's very hard for us, I mentioned at the beginning, it's very hard for us to, to look at other countries as a model for what we're going to do and make that work in our country. What we can do is take some pretty good practice from places and realize it's in places like Denmark and others in the UK um, where there are aligned incentives. People generally do better stuff where if you are physician and you're incented on the number of patients who've gotten their flu shots, you get their flu shots, right? Um, and if you look at a place like Kaiser here in the US, where everyone who's in, anyone who interacts with a patient is, is responsible for making sure that when they pull up their record, that anything that's overdue gets addressed. I um, mean, you build that culture, stuff gets done. Um, and uh, even in a place like the, the um, Department of Veterans Affairs, where they have the same ability to look at that information, because they don't have a system in place that makes each individual who in conversation responsible for that, stuff doesn't happen. It gets back to the transition issue, and I'm not sure even, even we in this room who are concerned about understand the scope of this change that we're undergoing in healthcare. But I can see that Mickey's big hand is on the sick. <laughs> uh, so it is time, I think, uh, and based on the fact that someone's holding a microphone other than me, Time to wrap up. Well, thank you so much to the panel. We really appreciate your taking the time to come out and perhaps if we kind of illustrative to listen, wonderfully illustrative to listen to kind of your insights on privacy, we all and, and trust. We certainly have a different take on trust, I think, now than we did when we started the evening. So thank you again for your insightful comments. We really kind of help you. Uh, appreciate your help in each help us communicate uh, these messages to the artists. With that, I'd like to kind of thank our sponsors without which these events would not be possible. Uh, NetApp, Juniper Networks, Optum Health, Symantec, Fairfax, and IT Consulting. We thank you very sincerely because uh, we really couldn't do these events in our, in our center without you. So thank you very much for your kind and generous support. Um, our next event, we don't have an exact date yet, but it's in uh, spring 2014, and you you are all on our mailing list. Uh, please complete your feedback forms, and we welcome your participation. Thank you all for your interaction and your participation. Uh, adds a lot of value to our events. Thank you again. Have a pleasant day.